The story of Gulliver's travels starts when Lemuel Gulliver, a young ship surgeon, decides to return to the seas when his medical practice in London suffers after the death of his friend and financial backer Mr. Bates. Gulliver, who is also trained in mathematics and navigation, travels for six years. After the relative improvement in his financial situation, he returns home and stays in London with his family. Three years later, a ship captain named William Pickard offers Gulliver a job aboard his vessel, Antelope. At first, their journey is successful and they prosper, but when they sail toward the East Indies, a violent storm kills 12 of their crew members and forces them away from their path. After hours of struggling with harsh waves and dealing with sickness and bad weather, Gulliver and six of his crewmates lower a small boat into the ocean and escape the ship. A short while later, big waves batter the boat and break it into pieces. In the storm, Gulliver gets separated from his friends, and after swimming for hours, with the help of an agreeable wind that pushes him to the shore, arrives at a beach in the evening, and after drinking some brandy that he had left in his pocket, he falls asleep. Nine hours later, when Gulliver opens his eyes, he finds himself tied to the ground with his arms, legs, and long hair bound with strings. He then sees several ligatures across his body which make it impossible for him to stand up. Bewildered by his condition, with his head fixed facing the sky and the sun hurting his eyes, Gulliver suddenly feels something moving on his body and climbing up to his chest. A few moments later, a tiny human about six inches in size, holding a bow and arrow, arrives on his breast and stands under his chin. A bit later, about 40 of them follow the first one and show up before his eyes. Gulliver is both astonished and terrified at the same time, so he screams and the little human creatures run away. A few moments later, one of them climbs back up again and courageously goes all the way near Gulliver's face. He then, amazed by what to his eyes was a giant, cries out, Hekina Digol. Gulliver, feeling uneasy, tries again to free himself and this time manages to break the strings from his left arm and loosen the ones that tie his hair, which causes him great discomfort. Seeing Gulliver struggle, the creatures run away before he could catch any of them. Suddenly one of them screams Tolgophonak, and with it tens of tiny arrows land on the stranger's left hand and prick him like needles. Immediately after that, the tiny humans shoot a volley of arrows into the air, which lands on Gulliver's body and face. The traveler tries to free himself again, but when he faces more arrows and spears, he decides that it would be wiser to just lay still on the ground until night and then free himself. Seeing Gulliver's unthreatening behavior, the tiny humans who Gulliver later gets to know as the Lilliputians, meaning the inhabitants of Lilliput, stop with the arrows and start building a structure about a foot and a half tall next to his head. When the structure is built, one of them, who seems to be an orator of an important position, goes on top of it and reads a declaration in their language of which Gulliver understands nothing. Gulliver tries to imply to the tiny humans that he means them no harm. Then, by putting his hand in his mouth a few times, he makes them understand that he's hungry. Seeing this, the orator descends from the stage and commands his soldiers to put several ladders on the stranger's body and take hundreds of baskets of meat and food to him. They then roll their biggest barrel of wine on his stomach until it reaches his mouth and open its legs. Seeing Gulliver devouring the food and drink makes the Lilliputians shout with joy and start dancing on his stomach. Gulliver feels tempted to grab a few of them and crush them to their death. But he reminds himself of the hospitality that they had just shown him and changes his mind. 
Next, a high-ranked official representing the king makes Gulliver understand that they will have to carry him to the capital, but he will be treated well. Gulliver in return lets him know that he wishes them to cut the ropes and strings off his body and hair. The king's representative orders his men to loosen the strings and then rub a healing ointment on Gulliver's blisters and injuries that were caused by their spears and arrows. A few moments later, Gulliver, who is under the influence of a sleeping medicine that was mixed in the wine, falls asleep and the little people push him to an ancient temple near the city and chain him there. At the temple, more than a hundred thousand Lilliputians accompany their emperor to see the newly captured giant. When the emperor sees that some of his people climb up and down Gulliver's body, he issues an order and makes it illegal to do so. He then, after making sure that the stranger is chained properly and can't escape, commands his soldiers to cut off the rest of the ropes and strings. To the astonishment and awe of his captors, Gulliver stands up for the first time. He looks around and sees an entertaining landscape. Around him there is a tiny green country with gardens, farms and miniature houses which to his eyes look like the painted scene of a city in a theater. Next the emperor rides his horse and comes closer to Gulliver. Behind him his family and courtiers all wait at a short distance and witness as their king tries to converse with the newly arrived giant. Gulliver tries speaking in every language that he knows, but it doesn't work. The emperor orders his men to feed him again and leaves, while still a considerable group of people remain at the scene. A bit later, a few troublemakers among the Lilliputians shoot their arrows at Gulliver and one of them narrowly misses his left eye. The officer in charge orders six of the troublemakers to be tied in ropes and surrenders them to Gulliver. Gulliver at first puts five of them in his pocket, then holds the sixth one in his hand and pretends that he is about to eat him, but instead gently unties him and lets him go. Then he does the same with the five remaining ones. Next, the emperor orders his people to build a bed for Gulliver, which is done by putting together 600 little beds and sewing hundreds of sheets and blankets. Also, to avoid more commotion and stop the disruption of public peace and workforce, he issues an edict that anyone who has seen the giant must return home and should not be anywhere within 50 yards of his house. Back at the court, the emperor consults his courtiers and wonders what to do with Gulliver. Some propose killing the giant with poison darts, but others argue that such a huge corpse rotting at their doorstep will cause a plague and it will spread to every corner of their kingdom. Some of the army officers relay their account of Gulliver's kindness towards the troublemakers, and the story has such a positive impact on the emperor that he prohibits anyone from harming the giant and orders for food to be delivered to him every morning from all the neighboring villages. He then assigns 600 servants to cater to Gulliver's every need, and 300 tailors to design his clothes according to the fashion of their country. He then designates six of his best scholars for the task of teaching their language to the giant. Three weeks later, Gulliver makes great progress in learning their language. Every time the emperor comes to visit, he would drop to his knees and begs the monarch for his liberty. And the emperor replies that this must be a work of time and he must take his decision with the advice of his council. One day, the emperor emperor tells Gulliver that according to their law, he must be searched by two of his officers and be stripped of his weapons if he is carrying any, but rest assured that when the time comes and he decides to leave their country, all of his belongings will be returned to him or he will be compensated for them. Gulliver consents and puts the two officers in his pockets, and they start making notes of his belongings. Upon reading the list, the emperor asks Gulliver to draw his scimitar so he could see the blade. The sword which looks massive to the tiny humans, shines bright in the sun and amazes everyone present. Next, the emperor asks Gulliver to surrender his pistols. Gulliver obeys the command, but before giving it up, he explains to his best effort what the pistol does. He then puts some powder in it and discharges it in the air. The astonishment this time is much bigger than the sight of his sword and a few of the tiny people fall on the floor as if they are struck dead. 
The Lilliputians then return all of Gulliver's belongings, except for his knife, his pistols and pouch, and his sword. In the following days, Gulliver makes a great effort to cultivate the trust of the Lilliputians to get his freedom back. For example, he allows kids to play hide and seek in his hair, or allows the tiny people to dance in the palm of his hand. The Emperor, who is now favorably disposed toward Gulliver, invites him to the palace to entertain him with a few customs and dances of their country. The first show is performed by those who seek new positions in the Empire. The subjects dance on a rope extended two feet above the ground, and whoever jumps higher will be most likely to get the job. Even old ministers and courtiers who have been employed for years compete in the dance to show that they still possess their abilities. The second dance is only performed before the emperor and his queen. In it, the dancers are asked to jump over or crouch under a stick that is held by the emperor or one of his ministers, and whoever shows more agility and performs better receives one of the three prized colorful ribbons. Gulliver organizes a military exercise and uses his handkerchief and a few sticks as the stage. To the delight of the Emperor, Lilliput's army engages in war games before him, and he likes it so much that asks them to repeat the show for a few days. Eventually, when one of the horses loses his balance by falling into a hole in the handkerchief, the show ends. The courtiers bring the matter of Gulliver's freedom before the Emperor. Everyone agrees except for a minister named Skyrish Bolglum, whose vote is overruled by the rest of the assembly. Gulliver finally gets his freedom back on a few conditions. First, he won't leave Lilliput without the Emperor's permission. Second, he can't enter their capital without their permission and a two-hour notice. Third, Gulliver must avoid walking on their farms and pavements. Fourth, as he walks around, he must take care not to trample a person or animal. Fifth, if an urgent message requires extraordinary dispatch, the giant should agree to carry the messenger and his horse in his pocket and take them to the destination, then bring them back safely to Lilliput. Sixth, he must agree to be Lilliput's ally against the kingdom of Blefusco and do everything he can to destroy their fleet, which is now getting ready to attack them. Seventh, Gulliver must help the farmer farmers and other workers by lifting heavy rocks and objects. And for the last condition, in two months' time, the giant must deliver the exact circumference of their realm by the measure of his paces around the coast. The first thing that Gulliver asks the Emperor after getting his freedom back is to be allowed to visit Lilliput's capital. The Emperor agrees and orders his people to stay inside to avoid getting trampled by the giant. After visiting the meticulously designed miniature metropolis, the Emperor delightfully shows all of his royal keep and palace to his now new friend. Gulliver cuts down a few trees and builds himself two stools to be able to stand and sit on without walking over the town. Two weeks later, a secretary from the palace named Reldressal speaks to Gulliver and tells him that an alliance of rebels and Blefuscudians are preparing to attack Lilliput and the Emperor is asking for his aid. Reldressal then explains that years ago, the Emperor's grandfather decided to order his subjects to break their eggs from the small end when he injured himself doing it from the bigger end. Following the edict, many of the Lilliputians protested against it, and the rival Blefuskian Empire joined the quarrel on the side of the rebels. Consequently, 11,000 people were killed, and all the Begindian literature was banned in Lilliput. After consulting Lilliput's admirals and spying on the enemy, Gulliver asks the Emperor for their strongest cables and bars of iron. He then twists the iron bars into hooks and after making 50 of them, goes to face the enemy's fleet. When he suddenly arrives on the Blefuscan shores, terrified by his size and presence, they jump out of their ships and run away. Gulliver fastens the hooks to the ships. At this moment, the enemy discharges thousands of arrows, which all sit on his face and head. Worried about losing his eyes, he suddenly remembers his eyeglasses and puts them on. Gulliver tries taking the entire Blefuscan fleet to Lilliput. But no matter how much he pulls, he can't move them. At this point, he realizes that they are all held fast by their anchors. Gulliver pulls out his knife and cuts the moorings, then easily drags the fleet with him 
himself and before the shocked eyes of the Blefuscans takes their fleet to Lilliput. At night, the Emperor of Lilliput and his court all gather on the shore, expecting Gulliver's arrival. When they first see the Blefuscan fleet and can't see their giant friend because he is in the water up to his neck, they conclude that he must have drowned. But they soon see Gulliver rising from the sea and rejoice at their victory. Gulliver screams, long live the most puissant king of Lilliput, and is welcomed with all the possible cheers and warmth by the tiny people. At court, the emperor promotes Gulliver to a Nardak, which is the highest honor possible in Lilliput. A few days later, the emperor of Lilliput, who has now tasted his greatest victory over their arch rivals, asks Gulliver to help him reduce the Blefuscan Empire into a province of Lilliput so he could force them to break their egg from the smaller end and therefore become the world's greatest emperor. Gulliver replies that he will not be an instrument of the Emperor to enslave free and brave people. This causes Gulliver to fall out of favor with the Emperor and gives his enemies, namely Flimnap and Boglum, room to push their anti-giant Man Mountain agenda at Lilliput's court. A few weeks later, a peace embassy from Blefuscu arrives in Lilliput and they end the war by agreeing to terms mostly favorable toward Lilliput. Gulliver receives the Blefuscans with kindness and they in return invite him to visit their country. Gulliver asks the Emperor to allow him to visit Blefusco, and the Emperor of Lilliput, who is now completely cold toward Gulliver, agrees. One night, Gulliver hears hundreds of people at his door shouting Berglum, meaning fire, and ask him to go and help. When Gulliver arrives at the palace, he sees that the Empress's apartment is burning. At first, he tries containing the fire by using small buckets, but when things get worse, he stands up and urinates on the flames, which puts them out instantly. Next, and after describing some of the strange customs and habits of the Lilliputians, Gulliver continues the story from the time that one of his friends from the palace goes to him privately and tells him that his enemies at the palace, led by Admiral Skyrish Bolglam and Flimnap the treasurer, under the influence of the queen who never forgave him for urinating on her palace, have succeeded in persuading the emperor that he is a traitor and guilty of public urination, treason for conspiring with the Blefuscan enemy and refusing to carry out the Emperor's order regarding the rest of the Blefuscan navy. The courtier tells Gulliver that at first it was proposed to set fire to his house at night and then shoot him with thousands of poison darts, or make Gulliver's servants put poison on his bed sheets and clothes. But his friend Rel Dressal asked for the judgment to be reduced to just gouging his eyes out. On top of that, there is a plan to gradually starve him to death, so that when he dies of hunger, they could easily cut his death then skinny body into pieces and carry it away until only his bones are left for display and marvel. The courtier then tells Gulliver that in three days a group of the Emperor's surgeons will arrive to make sure that the process of blinding him is done according to plan by sticking a sharp object into both his eyes as he is laid on the ground. Hearing the news, Gulliver becomes conflicted. Part of him wants to stand trial and convince the court of his innocence, and the other part feels feels vengeful towards the Lilliputians and wants to pelt their country with rocks until there is nothing left of it. Eventually, remembering his friendship with the Emperor and the favors that he received from him, combined with the support and hospitality that he received from the tiny people of that nation, make him decide to leave for Blefusco before the time for his punishment arrives. When Gulliver arrives at Blefusco, the entire country shows up at the shores to greet him. After a few hours, the king of Blefusco, accompanied by his royal court, arrives and receives him warmly. Three days later, Gulliver sees a real boat floating out in the ocean, and with the help of the Blefuscan fleet, drags it out of the water and realizes that it is but a little damaged. He then pleads with the Emperor of Blefusco to order his men to help Gulliver fix the boat and allow him to leave for his country. On the other side and in Lilliput, the Emperor who was under the impression that Gulliver has left for Blefusco to use the permission that he had granted him earlier and will return shortly, gets tired of waiting for him and sends an embassy to the neighboring empire and asks the Blefuscan king to send Gulliver to him bound to be punished like the traitor that he is. The Emperor of Blefusco, after consulting with his court, answers back that he can't send Gulliver to him as a captive, but it might make the Lilliputian monarchy 
happy to know that the giant man mountain has found a vessel of his size and will soon depart their world for good. Next, 500 Blefuscan workers make two sails for Gulliver's boat by stitching together 13 folds of their strongest linen. In about a month, and with the good wishes and gifts of the Emperor of Blefusco, Gulliver sets sail and leaves to find a way back home. Gulliver spots an English merchant ship and gets rescued by them. Gulliver stays with his family in London for two months, and during that time, he makes a good amount of profit by showcasing and then selling the livestock that he had brought with himself from Blefusco. If you have been getting value out of this channel and you would like to support it, you can now become a member by clicking on the join button. Or you could use Venmo or buy me a coffee directly from the links in the description box. Thank you very much.